All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to a quick uh, breaking news YouTube live. Well, it's not breaking news. Happened uh, earlier this morning, but I got news uh, from a bunch of drivers. So I wanted to hop on live and chat about it. But one of the companies that uh, came out a few years ago to challenge Uber and Lyft called Juno, which was operating only in New York City for the most part, um, but they actually announced today that they were going to be shutting down. And we'll get into the backstory and everything else that's happened. If you guys are watching live right now, welcome. Um, you should be able to uh, see the live chat going on. And let me just make sure it's working. Uh, looks like the audio is coming in loud and clear. But if you guys are watching live right now, you'll have access to the live chat down below on your phone. Or if you're on desktop, it should be over to the right hand side. Looks like we've got a bunch of people tuning in live already. So appreciate everyone who's coming on and uh, I see uh, that, that there are a bunch of New York City drivers in here. So uh, like I said, I'm going to go, you know, there've been a bunch of stories. Juno actually sent out an email to all of their drivers uh, today. And basically, I think anyone who's really been affiliated with the company, but long story short, I don't know if you guys remember all the way back in 2016. So if you weren't driving then, uh, it was a different time then. And this company, Juno, came along and they said to drivers, hey, we're going to have 24-7 phone support. We're going to have a tip option in the app. This this was before Uber had either of those things and you know Lyft didn't have phone support. They said they were going to give drivers equity in the company. They said that they were going to lower commissions and you can as you can might imagine drivers were like, "Wow, this sounds great. Uh sign me up." And lots of drivers frankly did sign up for Juno. I actually just checked my email since um you know, we signed up uh for Juno or I signed up for Juno myself, so when they would expand out of New York City that I could drive for them here in Los Angeles and they had a referral program. I never made Made a single penny off the referral program because they never went outside of New York City. But just through the rideshare guy alone, we signed up nearly 5,000 people for their waiting list. So that's not actual drivers, but it sort of just shows you if one person can sign up that many people, just how many people were excited about Juno. And so that was sort of then in 2016. And what kind of ended up happening was that they got some market share, but they never really went anywhere. They ended up being acquired by a company called Get, I think for $200 million. Now Get is an Israeli rideshare company. And when Get bought them, I believe it was in 2018, all these drivers who had been driving for Juno in New York City thought that they were going to get paid out. And you know, since they had been getting equity in the company and all this great stuff. And it turns out that a lot of those drivers kind of got screwed. They didn't get anything uh, from that sale. And so kind of what started off as this huge promising new rideshare service that was going to take on Uber and Lyft and, you know, was really listening to drivers uh, that was actually well-funded too. I think they got funded with over a hundred million dollars by a guy named Tom and Marco, who was very rich um, and very successful entrepreneur from his last company called Viber. Uh, they basically today announced that they're kind of giving up, you know, get Juno. They were, they were operating under the brand Juno in New York City, but they basically announced today that they were going to give up. And uh, I'm going to read this from a TechCrunch article that I saw because I think it's interesting, but basically they said that the company announced that it's closing its operations in New York effective today. Um, and basically what they're doing, they said that they also entered into a strategic partnership with Lyft to take on those accounts starting next year. So basically what they're saying is that they're giving up going out of business and selling that business to Lyft. So uh, very interesting news. I'm curious to hear what you guys have to think about it. I'll definitely share more of my thoughts. We posted an article on the Rideshare Guy about this a few hours ago. So if you're interested in reading that, I'll leave a link right now in the comments. You can go and uh, check out that article. Um, and then obviously I'm on YouTube right now talking to you guys. So happy to answer any questions. Looks like we're up to 70 people watching live right now. So I know a lot of people are, were interested in that Juno model and probably want to know what's going on. So feel free. If you guys haven't yet, give this video a thumbs up that, uh, helps other people see these YouTube lives and uh, make sure you subscribe to turn on those notifications so that you know when I'm going live. If you guys noticed, I actually just went live last week. And then today I thought this story was big enough that it warned warranted a quick live and to answer any questions you might have. I know there's a couple other questions I see 
coming in. Uh, Jonathan says, uh, I got the rideshare bat signal. Hello. I like that, Jonathan. That's funny. Um, and it looks like we got drivers from New York City. Robert from New York City. Let's roll Tina with the super chat. I appreciate that tip, Tina. That's awesome. If you have a question, you just moved yourself to the front of the line. So definitely appreciate that. And uh, let's start answering some of those questions. And you know, I can definitely just share some of my thoughts around uh, Juno because you know, I think what's uh, probably more than anything, I think that, you know, a lot of drivers wanted Juno to work, they wanted them to succeed. But ultimately, you know, kind of running a rideshare business is very expensive and very costly. Um, I guess that's the same thing, but it's also very tough. And so I think that these are really the problems that a lot of these rideshare companies are running into. And you're, you've probably noticed that there's a reason why on this channel, we don't like to hype up new rideshare companies, you know, I kind of understand just how difficult it is. And and just how challenging it is to run these rideshare companies. And while it's easy to start a company like Juno that sounds great and is gonna appeal to all these things that drivers love and these issues that drivers are having, I think you and I, we all know the struggles that drivers have, but solving those are a different thing. And really where I think Juno failed and kind of had the most trouble was uh, acquiring passengers. You know, really the only reason the passengers were taking Juno was because they were offering deep discounts. Now that's great. You know, you can pull market share over temporarily from Uber and Lyft by offering great discounts, but it has to be something sustainable. And I think that was really kind of the issue uh, that Juno ran into is that once those discounts went away, the passengers also went away, <laughs> right? So uh, that's kind of what I think, you know, that was really my question from day one. And we did an article and a video, our original article and video on Juno, which I'm gonna share right now in the live chat. Uh, so you guys can go read that if you're curious, but that was really the question I had is how is Juno gonna recruit passengers to a service? You know, most passengers enjoy Uber and Lyft. They like Uber and Lyft and the service works pretty well for them. There's not much to complain about from the passenger's point of view. So how is Juno going to re recruit those passengers? And ultimately, they did it through money and savings, but that just didn't last forever. So Rachel in Nevada says, it sounds like Uber and Lyft are always going to monopolize the rideshare business. Yeah, you know, so one of the interesting things I saw that basically what uh, Get CEO said uh, when they were kind of asked, uh, you know, why or you know why they folded or what happened was one of the things that they talked about was just the fact that regulations had made it really tough for them. So if you guys aren't aware, in New York City, drivers are paid a minimum wage, which I think is a good thing. They're not employees, but they're guaranteed a minimum wage. And what that minimum wage is based on, though, is these things called utilization rates. So if the companies aren't keeping drivers busy, they basically have to pay more uh, in, for, in the form of minimum wage. And that was one of the things that Juno pointed to. And I think that that was reasonable, but also, you know, kind of going back, I, I don't think that's the real reason. You know, it's sort of like Juno went out of business and like, oh, you know, blame the regulation, too much regulations. But personally, I think it really gets back to that fact that they just didn't have the ridership, right? When they kind of got rid of those discounts for passengers, everyone just went back to Uber and Lyft because those were the first apps they downloaded. Like why mess around with this dinky little third app, Juno, if they're not doing anything different and not doing anything better. So that was kind of my opinion there. Uh, Robert is in here from New York. So it looks like we got a lot of uh, Juno drivers or maybe just drivers coming in from New York. So Robert and Steven, uh, I know you guys are from New York. I'd love to hear your point of view on Juno. I'll share some feedback too that I've already started collecting from New York Juno drivers in case you're interested. I know we've got a lot of other drivers, uh, Rachel from Philly, Jerry from Vegas. You know, one of the good things that I think uh, drivers, you know, in New York right now, Uber and Lyft have actually put a hiring freeze. So they're not hiring new drivers uh, in New York right now is what I've what I've heard you know I'm not in New York but that's what people tell me and uh, so you know Juno and I guess competitors in general one of the nice things about having competitors is that you can go work you know if you needed a job and you can't get one with Uber or Lyft um, you can go work for them I do know that uh, via is still hiring drivers in New York City so that's one option. I'll leave a link right now if you guys are interested in learning more about VIA or signing up with them. I know they're primarily operating in New York City, 
uh, Washington, D.C. and Chicago. They're not out in L.A. in full force. I know they have a little pilot here, but they're not hiring tons of drivers. But uh, we've heard pretty good things. And uh, the drivers actually, uh, via at least says that their drivers make more than Uber drivers. So that's interesting. Uh, Quest 360 says, I really wish that Juno launched in other cities. Being limited to just one city is what killed the Juno app. And, you know, I did, I feel like I just got a new notification actually in the past few months that Juno was expanding their coverage to the New Jersey airport. But it just, it does sort of seem like, you know, they got things going in New York City and they just never quite got the traction that they were hoping for. And of course, when they sold to get, that's usually not a good sign. And then today, uh, <laughs> that's an even uh, much worse sign. Trader, or tra Trader 1727 says, Hi, Rideshare Guy. I'm from New Jersey. I've been waiting for Juno to cross over across, uh, I guess, the river or the bay or however you get from New York to New Jersey. Obviously, I'm, I'm from California. I don't know my New York uh, East Coast geography too well. Steven says, I wanted it to come to Cali. And I think, Steven, you know what? I think I really agreed with you. I think that this was one of the things that I you know, I wouldn't say we went all out in promoting Juno, but I was happy to cover them because I thought that they were one of the best chances drivers had uh, to sort of unseat the Uber and Lyft duopoly that is out there, right? Like these days, you know, we've done a bunch of videos. It seems like Uber and Lyft are the exact same company doing all the exact same things and all the exact same shitty things. Uh, but Juno was supposed to be different. And I think that's what is unfortunate about them uh, sort of going under. Jason with the $2 super chat, he says, I need a shirt in 3XL, please. Well, Jason, these shirts are a little more than two bucks. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you guys do want a shirt, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be giving any away today, but we do give them away on uh, all of my monthly YouTube lives. So that's a good reason to subscribe to the channel and also uh, turn on notifications so that you know when I go live. And if I do do a giveaway, um, then you'll know and you can win. I just left a link to the shirt on Amazon. This shirt is actually only 20 bucks. I said it. I don't think we actually make any money <laughs> off of these shirts. Uh, but I wanted to put them up there. So I left a link there. If you guys do want a shirt with our new logo, you can check it out there. Uh, Ruben says that was meant to be a question. I uh, might have to re-ask that question. Real Apollos, what's going on? Uberman. Uh, I don't know if this is the real Uberman, but maybe it's the new Uberman 2.0. He says, hello, Mr. Rideshare Guy. It's been a while. I don't know. I went, I went live last week for my normal uh, November monthly live that I do every single month. So if you guys missed that, you may uh, not be subscribed. And uh, I see we've got a bunch of people in here, over 90, so and only 26 thumbs up. So definitely, uh, if you want to give a thumbs up, maybe you guys are driving right now and uh, um, may not be safe. But once you pull over, I always appreciate that. So uh, John says, maybe the fact that they burnt uh, drivers hurt the standing in the community. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. You know, Juno, I mean, they've sort of been on this downward path, to be frank. Like, I would say that today when I got the news from drivers that they were uh, going under uh, or going out of business, it wasn't necessarily a surprise for sure. But I think it's still unfortunate because I do think one thing we've seen is that, you know, even having, so if you guys remember back when Juno launched, Uber didn't have a tipping option. Uber didn't have, uh, I don't even think they had phone support period. And so what Juno at least announced and with the beginning, they had 24 seven phone support, they had a tipping option, right? So you can even see, even though uh, Juno kind of ended up screwing over a bunch of drivers with this whole sale and equity thing and now going out of business, they did benefit drivers just from the sense of that competition, right? Uber went and added that, right? And if you don't have an Uber Greenlight Center within two hours of you, you know just how valuable that phone support can be, even if uh, sometimes it feels like you're pulling teeth, you know, it's better than having nothing. So Jonathan says, New York drivers, what's the scene like in general after the regulation? So Jonathan, that's really interesting. Uh, just touching on the regulation I mentioned earlier. One thing that's really interesting that's happening right now in New York City is that, you know, there's this minimum wage rules now, and it's sort of more of like a minimum pay uh, that drivers are supposed to get on each and every single ride. And what's happening is Uber and Lyft are now limiting where and when drivers can go online, right? Because if they have to pay you, let's say 20 bucks an hour, they don't want you going online Tuesday afternoons at 3 p.m. on the edge of the city when you're not gonna get any rides, right? Like, why are they gonna pay you for that? And so I guess from like a business point of view, I understand why Uber and Lyft are limiting. And I would even probably like, 
disagree with some of the drivers who have been upset and protesting because I mean, that's sort of, you know, what you would expect. Like, I don't know how, what you would ask of Uber and Lyft. Like if, if that situation was there, like, what are they supposed to do to drivers that just go and like sit on a Tuesday afternoon at 3 PM? They have to say, you can't log in and you can't go online. And so for me, I think with this regulation stuff, it's really just understanding what are the trade-offs, right? I think minimum wage for drivers is a good thing. You shouldn't go out there and make $2 an hour. But at the same time, you have to understand that if you do want a minimum wage or if you do want some type of better situation, there may be trade-offs and limiting when and where you go online within reason, I think uh, makes sense. I mean, that's kind of even really, if you guys are watching this channel right now, you're probably not going online Tuesday at 2 p.m. You probably know that that's a worse possible time to go online. You know the busy times and you know the busy places. And so you kind of are really thinking like that. So now now Uber and Lyft are kind of forcing you uh, to think about that. So hopefully that makes sense. Mr. Vic says, uh, you turned me on to several delivery apps. Thanks, rideshare guy. Yeah, you know, that's actually funny. Uh, right now, drivers, you know, there may be Uber and Lyft only, but there are a lot of delivery apps out there uh, that I wouldn't say, you know, are better or worse, but they're different, uh, right? And so if you haven't tried some of those delivery apps, definitely go ahead and check that out. I'll leave a link to our page where we've got a list of all the various options. AT, I don't know if that's the real Uberman. I think the real Uberman is retired and now uh, the artist formerly known as Uberman. He goes by uh, Copart uh, Auto Auction Rebuild or something like that. He's got a cool channel now on all about these different auctions. It's doing really well. So kudos to him. Dougie says from West Palm Beach says Juno was coming to Florida but never came. Unfortunately, that is correct. What's up, driver man? Rideshare 411. Welcome to everyone. Uh, Rachel says that makes a lot of sense about passengers going back to Uber and Lyft when Juno's deals are gone. So I wanted to share a little bit of feedback that we've been getting from drivers in New York City. So one thing that I heard um, in uh, Ithaca, New York, uh, Uber driver and big rideshare guy, uh, reader and fan who's always emailing me, I always appreciate his feedback. Jeff Brown shared that he isn't surprised by, he, he told me he isn't surprised by this news at all. He says, um, you know, I'm not the least bit surprised by this. Lyft and Uber are behemoths and anyone who has ever attempted to enter the market has gotten obliterated and Juno is only the latest. If you guys remember, there was a company called Fasten and he says they went belly up uh, a year and about a year and a half ago in the Boston and Austin, so that's Boston, Massachusetts and Austin, Texas area. So, you know, there are other competitors out there, but I think that that's really what you have to look out at as like, what's their strategy, right? Like, I think we, even though it's unfortunate that Juno went out of business, you kind of have to look and you can kind of really dissect like, why did they go out of business? And to me, the most obvious thing is just what was their long-term strategy in acquiring passengers? And I thought, I don't think they ever figured that out, right? Like the Uber and Lyft apps work really well from the passenger's point of view. From the driver's point of view, you know, there's some issues, but from the passenger's point of view, right? Like passengers rarely complain. There's stories in the media about safety and all that, but they do millions of rides a day and things rarely uh, go awry. But one time, you know, that uh, people don't, or one area that people don't like taking Uber and Lyft is when surge pricing or when it's prime time, right? So for example, and I'm not saying I'm going to go start a company like this today, but one idea would be if I'm starting a new company and I'm looking to try and attract passengers over from Uber and Lyft, maybe I charge them a monthly fee and there's no surge pricing, right? So then at least, you know, you're sort of offering something different. And not only is it something different, but it's a, an exact pain point, you know, that people are having on Uber and Lyft, right? If it's just cheaper, that's not a pain point, right? Like no one's complaining that Uber and Lyft are too expensive. If anything, you know, it's the drivers that are saying the rides are too cheap. So you kind of have to see, right? If you're looking at any new rideshare company, I think it's easy to identify a bunch of areas, how they can help drivers and improve this and lower commissions and lower that. Like that's the easy part. It's really thinking about like how you're going to get those riders because as you guys know, like, hey, I'm all about supporting other companies. But I mean, if there's no rides, what what are you going to do? You can only sit there for so long. You need to make money, right? So let me know what you guys think about that. Uh, John says, does anyone like Instacart? Uh, Mr. Vic says, Instacart, thumbs down. So I know Instacart's having some issues right now with uh, some of their workers going on strike and 
They've been changing some of the bonus systems and things like that. My best advice to you with services like Instacart or really any of these services is to do your research, do a little due diligence. But I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, if you're going to try a new service, whether it's Juno or Via or Instacart, like no, there's no better way to learn than firsthand experience, right? Like it's not hard. You guys know it's not hard to sign up for these services. You can do it from your couch. Oftentimes, you don't even need to go in, especially for delivery. You don't even need to do an inspection. There's a little bit of a learning curve. But you know, if you've done Uber or Lyft, you can figure it out pretty quickly and see for yourself, right? Like understand, hey, there's a learning curve. Like when you first started Uber and Lyft, you probably didn't know exactly what you're doing. Over time, you started figuring things out and maybe hopefully making more money. You know, that's really like what my whole site and YouTube channel is about. It's kind of helping you understand that if you know what you're doing, you can make a lot more than the average driver. Like frankly, I think the average driver and the average delivery person doesn't really know what they're doing. Um, they don't really know what they're talking about. So you probably don't want to be listening to them. You probably don't want to be following them. You want to be doing your own thing and uh, listening to advice from people who kind of know what they're talking about. So PT Boober says, uh, how does RIP Juno affect the drivers? So, I mean, I don't think there's going to be any direct effect, but I do think that just less competition in general is a bad thing for drivers, right? And, uh, you know, maybe even passengers, but probably more so drivers. I think having Juno around, especially like well-funded competitors, kind of just keeps Uber and Lyft on their toes and keeps them thinking about, you know, how they're treating drivers. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think Juno is the perfect example. They added a tipping option and 24 seven phone support, and then Uber ended up adding it. Right. So Lyft kind of used to be, excuse me, Lyft kind of used to be that competitor that in my mind, like really was like always one step ahead in how they're treating drivers. But these days, you know, they're both public companies. It kind of seems like uh, they both, you know, are doing kind of the same stuff. And there's not really, they're not really like pushing each other like a third competitor might be. So that's sort of my thoughts there. Jason says surge price is how much it should really cost for all rides. So, I mean, that's a good example, Jason, right? Like if you're starting a competitor to Uber and Lyft and you're trying to attract passengers, maybe you're going for those passengers who are, you know, don't want the price variability, right? They don't want some rides to cost $10. And if it's surging to cost 20, maybe you just charge 15 every single time, right? And maybe that's sort of, you know, like flat rate pricing, for example, maybe you ignore any fares that are, you know, minimum fares, right? So I don't know, I've talked to a lot of people and companies about that. And so that's sort of one of the ideas that I had if you were starting a new company and you're really trying to attract passengers, like I wouldn't even bother with the minimum fares. I would really look for those rides that were like three to four miles and above since we know that drivers would like them. Um, and it's also just more of like kind of a premium or quality passenger, right? The passenger who wants to go like one mile and pay six bucks is probably not the best customer. And so that's sort of how you, you can now sort of start to see it's like, okay, I've got that to differentiate me. I've got no surge price to differentiate me. And we just didn't really see any of that with Juno. Juno's strategy was frankly just to charge less than Uber or Lyft. And it worked to gain some market share, but it obviously didn't work to sustain the company. So clearly, uh, Juno never came to me for consulting because uh, I'm not saying I could have saved their company, but I think that uh, like I'm not surprised, on, you know, even though I wish they would have succeeded. I'm not surprised that they didn't. So hopefully, uh, I appreciate that comment. Jason uh, Stephen Roan Sr. says, See, being that Uber is struggling in the stock market, do you think the company is in danger being that they have stockholders to answer to? I don't think Uber is in danger at all. I think that Uber's CEO, Dara Khosrow Shahi, I mean, once you're a public company, you really have to watch that stock price and their stock price is in a tumble. So I would say that if he doesn't turn things around in the next six to 12 months, his tenure at Uber could be over, but I don't think the company itself is going anywhere. So hopefully that answers your question. What's up, uh, Rideshare Lisa? Good to see you back in here. Wow. Last week and this week. Thanks for joining. Gilbert says, this is why Lyft and Uber need to be regulated. You clearly see that they have a monopoly. That's why both of them get away with what they do. And, you know, I think that for a lot of states and cities, Gilbert, you're right. There are a lot, you know, obviously in California, they passed AB5 to regulate Uber and Lyft, you know, make them 
classify their drivers as employees. In New York City, they're passing all these different uh, minimum wage and utilization and things like that. In Seattle, I saw that they're looking at a minute. So what's really cool, guys, is in, you know, I know we can all, we, I won't get into like the political side of regulation, but uh, what's one thing that I, I think you guys are all going to like, in the city of Seattle, I saw that the city is actually looking at a minimum wage and looking at creating a third party center to handle unfair deactivation claims, right? So if you ever have talked to a driver who's been unfairly deactivated by Uber or Lyft, you know that you're kind of screwed or like shit out of luck if that happens. And so the city of Seattle has actually gone out and they're going to start charging a little bit more in taxes on every ride to passengers, but they're creating, they're spending like millions of dollars to create this kind of very cool third party center where if you get deactivated by Uber or Lyft, you go to them, basically the government regulators, and uh, they're going to like arbitrate the case between you and Uber or Lyft. And to me, that sounds like a great thing since I know so many drivers, you know, I think that um, Rideshare Revolution, uh, another YouTuber, I think he, it looks like he just, I talked about this on my YouTube live last week, but I know he had an issue. I'm not sure what the status is right now where he was unfairly deactivated or at least in his mind. And uh, right now he really has no recourse. He's kind of screwed out of luck, but with something like this, he would be able to take it to a third party. So I think stuff like that is pretty interesting. Jay says, uh, my last Juno trip ended at 6 p.m. tonight. Had another trip lined up, but the passenger canceled. Well, if I had a beer with me right now, I think that we could all, uh, you know, pour one out for uh, Juno. We'll have a moment of silence for Juno. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> but we'll all cheers to Juno because like I said, even though um, they definitely didn't do everything right, I think that ultimately, you know, more competition is a good thing for drivers. So there are a couple other things I want to talk about before I hop off. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, definitely let me know right now. Um, the gig lifestyle says I got deactivated. Uh, I got deactivated from Uber. So I would love that type of center. Uh, Andrea says Amazon flex is the way to go. Good money. No smelly food or prissy passengers. Yeah, we've got a bunch of articles and videos on Amazon flex. So definitely check that out. Dougie says zero ride share is coming. That's Z I R O 100% uh, of the fare with no sign up fee. So Dougie, that's a perfect example of something that sounds great for drivers, but also for me, I would just think about how realistic it is, right? Like obviously these companies have to make money somehow. So how are they going to get passengers? Are they well-funded? What cities are they launching in first? Um, not that it's a bad thing, but I think go into this with a healthy skepticism, right? Like I wouldn't invest all my time or any of my money in any new company until I sort of see a lot more for them. But hey, you know, I think it's definitely a good thing if uh, more of these companies come out. Jay says, sorry, just got here. No worries. We're still going strong. And if you guys are just joining right now, definitely go ahead and give me a little thumbs up. Subscribe to this channel if you uh, haven't already. And um, you can also replay this stream if uh, you're just joining late or uh, you are watching at a later moment, you can always leave a comment and I'll get uh, back to that. I want to answer one or two more questions. Um, if you guys are just joining now, though, you can replay it and get all the background on Juno. Uh, Steven says Apex. I'm not sure what Apex is, Steven. I think you mentioned that earlier. It sounds familiar, but uh, let's see. Apex Rideshare. According to their website, it's more than a ride. It's an experience. So on their website, it says Apex Mobile is not a transportation network company. Okay, so they're saying they're not like Uber or Lyft, but they allow you to reserve your favorite driver. We drive and deliver. You simply reserve and request. So without getting into all the details, this sounds pretty similar to user, U-Z-U-R-V, which I think is a super cool idea. Just the one thing you have to be careful with is that uh, companies like this, if they're connecting you with a passenger over an app or you're basically if you're doing doing a ride without being on the Uber or Lyft platform. Technically, it's illegal, right? So obviously, lots of drivers do this with their regular passengers and all that. But if you're just like finding random people um, through an app, that is basically illegal. So you just have to understand the potential repercussions there. Mike says, what do you think about Lyft's lockout in New York City? So Mike, I think you're... So there's two things that Uber and Lyft have done in New York City. The first is that they limit when and where you can go online. And then I just got screenshots from a driver, a good friend, Cameron in New York City, who I've had on the podcast. And he showed me something really interesting. Uh, let's see if I don't know if I can share it right now. But 
Um, basically, what he showed me is that Uber and Lyft's new queuing schedule. So it really looks a lot like DoorDash, for example, where you sort of have to select a schedule ahead of time. And then, you know, it shows you like, okay, 6am, 7am, 8am is available, but 2am, 3am, 4am is all full. And so I'm still, to be honest, I'm still learning a little bit about that since I'm in LA, but uh, it looks kind of, uh, you know, pretty restrictive, I guess you would say. So if you have any more feedback, uh, definitely let me know. Um, let's see. Joel says I'm from New York city locked out of Lyft since early October. So feel free to let me know. I don't know, Joel, if you mean that you are locked out because of like a deactivation issue, or maybe you don't have a high enough acceptance rate or something like that. Uh, but let me know there. Let's see. What other questions? Uh, do, 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 do. James Cook says, it seems that Uber turns surge on and off when they want. Normally, there isn't widespread surge here in the Bay Area, but today it's been surging everywhere like it used to be two years ago. Yeah, you know, one thing I will say, you guys, is that Uber like with their algorithm, right? It's It can be very manual, okay? There's a lot of levers they can push and they can pull. So while it is important to understand the sort of surge patterns in your city, I will say that it can definitely, you know, there can be surge in one place uh, one week and, you know, every week, and then they change something in their algorithm or, you know, offer a different bonus or whatever it is, and things are different the next week. So I think it's just important to kind of understand that and learn and adapt, you know, really kind of control the things that you can uh, control. So Jay says, I'm in New York. Lyft only lets me online in New York City when it is busy. Yep. So that's exactly what uh, I was talking about there. Joel, though, says he's been locked out of Lyft since early October. So if you guys want to shoot me an email with details, harry at the rideshareguy.com, because I think there are some pretty, uh, very different regulations in New York City right now. And we're going to be doing a couple articles and video on that, because I think it's super important to kind of sort through it all. It is confusing, though, right? So Mike says Uber is giving you hours to work when you want, but Lyft uh, is really only saying when they want. So they're sort of saying that Lyft is kind of like either a allowing you on or not. But I think right now, Uber and Lyft are testing a lot of things that are frankly just more restrictive in New York City. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, so I think one of the, and actually Uber Vegan says, Harry, Lyft started off with a schedule system back in the very beginning of their operations, but people kept staying online regardless and they dropped it. So actually, I think I started driving for Lyft like five years ago when they first had that scheduling system. So we'll see uh, if they kind of come back to that. And Jay says, if you do 180 trips in the last 30 days, you can go online anytime in New York City. Leo says, Via is the other good way to drive now in New York City. And so definitely recommend Via. I've been hearing good things. You know, obviously it's important to kind of drive for multiple cities. Uh, Dougie is really talking about this advertisement. <laughs> I'm going to have to put you in timeout, Dougie. I don't know why you keep typing that. Um, and Jay says Via is mostly like Uber Pool. Yeah, you know, the thing I like about Via, though, even though it's mostly Uber Pool, all the passengers know that it's shared pool and that it's Uber Pool. And so they're sort of like they tend to be ready a lot quicker. This is at least a, what I at least what I hear from drivers and they don't go and make all these little stops. It's sort of more thoroughfares and they've got some other options now, but that's kind of what uh, what is most of their business. So hopefully that update was interesting for you guys. There's actually some interesting stories happening in New York City right now. So I'm going to be doing some research on that and talking to a bunch of drivers in New York City. Uh, too bad I'm not driving in New York City. Maybe I could even uh, make a trip out there and do some research. But for now, I'm going to go and uh, do a little research and I'll get back to you guys. I appreciate you all joining for this YouTube live though and uh, getting a little info about Juno. If there was a question that I didn't answer, feel free to leave a comment below and uh, I will go ahead and get to that when I have some time. Uh, otherwise, hopefully you guys enjoyed this live on Juno and unfortunately they're going out of business. Uh, if you haven't given this video a thumbs up yet and you enjoyed it, please do so now and go ahead and subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications. You got to hit that little bell so that you know when I'm going live. If you missed, I went live last week. So if you missed it, you may not have notifications on. And if you're watching right now, do it right now before you forget because there's a lot happening and I'll be uh, here to keep you guys informed. Appreciate it and uh, take care.